I'm certain that all of us are anxious to get back to the public gatherings of worship here at Redeemer Church. I want to read you a letter from a pastor in Washington, D.C., a letter that he wrote to his own congregation. Another thing that has impressed me in connection with this epidemic is the fact that conditions may arise in a community which justify the extraordinary exercise of powers that would not be tolerated under ordinary circumstances. This extraordinary exercise of power was resorted to by the commissioners in closing up the theaters, schools, churches, in forbidding all gatherings of any considerable number of people indoors and outdoors, and in restricting the numbers who should be present, even at funerals. The ground of the exercise of this extraordinary power was found in the imperative duty of the officials to safeguard as far as possible the health of the community by preventing the spread of the disease from which we are suffering. There has been considerable grumbling, I know, on the part of some, particularly in regard to the closing of the churches. It seems to me, however, in a matter like this, it is always wise to submit to such restrictions for the time being. If, as a matter of fact, it was dangerous to meet in the theaters and in the schools, it certainly was no less dangerous to meet in churches. The fact that the churches were places of religious gathering and the others not, would not affect in the least the health question involved. If avoiding crowds lessens the danger of being infected, it was wise to take the precaution and not needlessly run in danger and expect God to protect us. And so, anxious as I have been to resume, to resume work, I have waited patiently until the order was lifted. I started to worry at first as it seemed to upset all of our plans for the fall work, but I soon recovered my composure. I said to myself, why worry? God knows what he is doing. His work is not going to suffer. It will rather be a help to it in the end. Out of it, I believe, great good is coming. All the churches, as well as the community at large, are going to be the stronger and better for this season of distress through which we have been passing. Well, as I say, that's a letter from a pastor to uh, his church in Washington, D.C. in 1918, during the flu epidemic. Reverend Francis Grimke, pastor of 15th Street Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. Beloved, the times we are living in are not unprecedented. The church has been in this place before. Let me offer you two places in the Bible that you can turn to, that I have been turning to, to help me during these very stressful and impatient times. The first is in Psalm 27, and by the way, not preaching on these, just going to give them to you and point out one, one thing that you need to know about one word. Psalm 27, verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, I'm going to take you to Isaiah 40 in just a second, but let me say this about the word wait. The word wait, as it's used here, W-A-I-T, in this text in Psalm 23, does not mean what you think it means. Neither does the word wait mean what you think it means when it's used in that very familiar text in Isaiah 40, beginning at verse number 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Beloved, in both of these texts, 
Isaiah 40, Psalm 27. The word wait does not mean like a waiting room, like be patient, wait. The word wait has the understanding of uh, wait in the, in the sense of a waiter, in someone who is serving you when you go into a restaurant that obviously you can't go into now, but we've all been served by waiters. Waiters are those who serve. And beloved, if COVID-19 has done one thing, it has made waiters out of all of us. What do I mean by that? Waiters in the sense that we are humble servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, of Jehovah God. And yes, there is the sense that we are waiting on him to lift the restrictions so that life can get back to normal. But in our waiting, we must be servants. In our waiting, we must be waiters in the sense of, am I fully submitting myself to the plan and purpose and will of a sovereign God in the midst of all of this? Have I put my will underneath his will? Am I a waiter in the sense of waiting on the Lord in serving him? If you go book, uh, to the book of Numbers, the book of Leviticus, you'll, you'll see verses about how Aaron's sons waited upon Aaron in the service of the Lord. That's what this waiting is all about. How are you serving the purposes of God during your waiting in COVID-19 uh, COVID isolation? Are you reading the Bible? Are you praying? Are you waiting on the Lord by serving others, reaching out to others, moving beyond thinking about yourself and serving the needs of others, your neighbors, your immediate family, um, uh, your, uh, your colleagues, uh, those that you become strangers, people that we become aware of who need our service. As much as you've done it unto the least of these, Jesus said, you've done it unto me. How are you waiting on the Lord? How are you serving the Lord during COVID-19 isolation? Wait on the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord.